Pastor Itoai Godalo bears his mind as regards the state of the nation and the role of the church in today's Nigeria. And Governor Yahya Bello receives advice as regards the next step in his political career. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Anna Paul. The senior pastor of the Trinity Church, Itwa Igodalo, has stated that it is foolish to reject the COVID-19 vaccine. He urged pastors to encourage their congregation to seek scientifically proven information from professionals on the COVID-19 vaccine, rather than spread conspiracy theories and unverified information. While speaking on the state of the nation, he asked that leaders of the country make better use of its resources for the benefit of Nigerians. Pastor Itwa Igodalu is here with us and he joins us. Thank you very much for joining us, Pastor Itwa. Is it that the message is not being preached right or is it that the people are hard on hearing? Because, I mean, it's supposedly, um, it's supposed to show in our attitude and in our dealings with one another. Am I wrong? It's a mixture of both, to be honest. In some areas, the message is not preached right, is not preached forcefully, is not preached with conviction, is not preached with authority, because some of us pastors, some of us ministers have even lost the voice, the gumption, the moral authority to actually preach the messages the way they should be preached. And then again, because of the situation in the country, the state of the nation, the high poverty index, and the um, almost um, uh, inculcated culture of, uh, of corruption. Uh, it has almost become a culture. And um, there's even a generation that does not know good from bad, right from wrong. Uh, it seems almost a normal and natural thing to do, uh, even in this day and age. So things have gone so bad in Nigeria in terms of the moral fiber of the nation and the attitude of the people that uh, the church itself is not uh, left left alone. Uh, and therefore, we have a lot of that, that challenge going on right now. So um, it takes a while. You know, somebody says you need to repeat a message about nine to 15 times before people can actually receive and absorb it and understand it. You need to keep repeating it and showing examples and proving to the people that what you are telling them is right. Uh, but sometimes in Nigeria, people are in such dire straits that they cannot wait for the manifestation of what is right. It takes a lot of sacrifice in Nigeria to try and do things on the right and straight and narrow path. Even the people you want to do it for will criticize you. And even the people you are amongst will say to you that, are you the only one? And if you do not cooperate with them, then they either make life difficult for you or victimize you or even uh, move against you and make you seem like the bad person. That's really how tough and difficult things are in Nigeria as we speak. Now, um, like I said earlier on, a lot of preachers shy away from these things. In fact, um, it's even difficult for you to walk into a church and hear a pastor saying, go get your voter's card or uh, register and get voted. Uh, vote whoever your choice is, but make your vote count. You hardly even hear those kind of things come from the pulpit. But you, as a, a preacher, you have sat on several government panels. You have served in many capacities. And one would really wonder how you do this and still manage to be a preacher. Because, you know, there are people who will look at you and say, well, you're no longer a real preacher. You have been politicized. You have been stung by the politics bee. But I want to ask, these politicians that we're quick to point fingers at, and I'm in no way trying to play the devil's advocate for any politician, are from amongst us. They're from our communities. They're from our states. There's some even related to us. 
But it's very easy for us to say when we talk about corruption, we say, oh, our leaders are corrupt. But our leaders are supposed to be a mirror of society. So does that mean that maybe our society in itself it's ba it is bad and that's why we have bad leaders? Are we deserving of the leaders that we have? Sometimes I think we are because the leaders come from among the people in the society. But it is the leaders that, first of all, uh, instituted the culture of the society. The fish rots from the head. But uh, year and year upon leadership, decade and decade upon leadership, have instituted a culture of corruption that it has now become endemic. It has become the norm almost in Nigeria. And everybody thinks almost the same way. So it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of shouting, a lot of crying, a lot of begging, a lot of pleading, a lot of teaching to change this culture. Because if, if you are not corrupt or corruptible or bendable, you are almost like uh, you are not normal. It's like uh, you are running against the grain of things. And you do find that people tend to want to compromise you or force you to compromise or insist that you must compromise or thereafter punish or waste your time. For example, a lot of people also in Nigeria don't even know their rights. They don't know their rights. They're easily intimidated. They don't know what they should stand for. The law in Nigeria says that you cannot unlawfully detain a man for longer than 24 hours. Is entitled to his phone call, entitled to his bail, entitled to his lawyer, and you must give a reason why he's been detained. But in Nigeria today, they give onerous bail conditions that some people have even become professional bail administrators. Okay, bring a house, bring a civil servant who has a house in Ikoye, a house in Abuja, a house in Lokoja, this, that, and the other. Impossible bail conditions that don't work. What the law says, a man is innocent until proven guilty. So EFCC, uh, ICPC, police, they lock you up for one month. Nobody is asking after you. Because if you're a nobody, you're a nobody. You can't talk to anybody. And they keep you there, and there's no right. So people don't know their rights. They're intimidated by everything around them. They're oppressed. They're suppressed. They're abused. They're marginalized. They're they are dehumanized. And they think less of themselves and they are not emancipated in their brain. And therefore, we have this problem all over Nigeria, okay? You can go, and uh, I, I, I go to the prisons a lot. There are people in, in prison today because they stole 10,000 Naira or something like that, or because people cannot find 5,000 Naira to help them get a lawyer that will talk about their bill. Or they're just there awaiting trial. Uh, the judges don't sit, the magistrates are not available. And the guy spends two years in prison because they said he stole a goat or stole a fowl or he was in the wrong place at the wrong time or they found him wandering on the streets and they just keep him there because he's from a poor background. He has nobody to speak up for him. Nobody has come to look for him. And he's just there in prison, in jail, eating government food, no trial, no judicial process, nothing. Many people also in EFCC like that all over the place and nobody to speak up for them. This is the challenge in Nigeria. Nobody to speak up for you. Nobody to tell you that you have a right. I was listening to Falano the other day, and when he was reading out the rights of the Nigerian, even for me at my level, I found it very interesting. I didn't know that we had all those rights. It's all in the law, it's in the constitution, but people don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, let's talk about the lethargic nature, We're still talking about us and the Nigerians. Um, of how we deal with issues of governance. Um, we see a lot of people very vocal on social media. We see a lot of people vocal in, you know, their small gatherings on their dinner tables, sometimes in bare parlors. But when it comes down to casting our votes and making our voices count, I mean, you can see a classic example is what happened in 2019. The, the, there was a serious case of voter apathy. And aside from the people who even have, you know, the voters' cards to go vote, there are lots of people who don't even have these voters' cards, but they're always complaining. Can we say that those people have a right to <laughs> complain about good governance? Because you say, you know, they say if you don't vote, or whether you vote or not, if you decide not to show up, 
you have made a decision one way or the other. So you cannot complain about bad governance or how bad the situation of things are if you have not one way or the other casted your vote. Now, I also know that the election process in Nigeria has its highs and its lows, and the lows may be more than the highs. But how can we, from the angle of the church, and I'm saying we here, you, sir, um, help people to understand how important it is to have your say in choosing the kind of leaders that we have? Because 10 years, or sorry, two years down the line, we're already complaining. And, and look, we, we still have some more years to go under this administration. And we're complaining about insecurity. We're complaining about poverty. We're complaining about almost everything. What is the role of the church in making people understand that they have rights? Because I know that if we're waiting on the NOA, we probably might wait the rest of our lives. One of the problems of the church is um, the lack of information and exposure uh, and knowledge of some of the pastors and the kind of doctrine or religion that we we're preaching. When I first got born again, what they used to say to me was that, um, come out from among them. What has light got to do with darkness? Politics is dirty, it's of the world. You mustn't get involved, this and that and this and that. I think that's a great misnomer and it's a great injustice to the average citizen and to the average Christian. Jesus, I dare say, was very political. He challenged the Greeks, the Romans, the authorities of the day. He challenged the Pharisees, the Sanhedrins, and the Sadducees, and told them that they were white sepulchers, that they were hypocrites, and they were not practicing what they preached. And the church needs to do that. We must get involved in politics. We must get involved in leadership. We must get involved in selecting and being part of the selection of the people who rule and govern us uh, as, as a nation. Let's not play the ostrich and tell us that we should stay in our caves and be praying and fasting and hoping that God will come down from heaven and wrought a great deliverance. God doesn't operate like that. God cooperates with men to do what he wants to do on earth. If you don't do what you should do, if Moses didn't stretch out his hands, over the Red Sea. The Red Sea wouldn't have parted. So God wants your cooperation for you to do what you need to do, and then he will do what you cannot do. And most of these things is common sense. The, the, the David was a Christian. He was a president. So also was Moses. He was a Christian. He was a president. So also was Solomon. He was a Christian. He was a president. He had a pastor, Nathan, and all people like that who came and consulted with him from time to time. And so it was people like Nathan who were able to speak truth to power in people like David who made him correct his bad decision of sleeping with Bathsheba's wife. If you try that in Nigeria, they will accuse you of disloyalty. They will accuse you of, uh, 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 of, of, of witch hunting. They will accuse you of criticism of them. But if Nathan had not spoken to David and told him that what he did as a president was bad, he would have destroyed the whole economy of Israel. And this is what the church needs to do. We need to get our voice. We need to speak and tell the people and the leaders and whoever that what you are doing is bad. It's very, very bad. It is unacceptable. It's ungodly. It is not good for the people for you to do these things. And if you cannot say it, then you don't have any right to a spiritual leadership of any sort. It means you are not consulting God or you cannot hear from God. Nathan heard from God and he spoke to David and says, David, you are the man. He spoke to him politely, told him a story, and then pointed to him and says, what you did was wrong. And David, a good leader, had the humility to apologize and tell Nathan that I am sorry. Please talk to God, beg God for me to help me. Our leaders won't do that. They will put you in jail. If you had a contract with them, they will cancel it. If you wanted to do something, they will attack you. They will go and start saying all sorts of things. But any leader that is not able to listen to criticism, is not able to listen to comments, is not able to accept the views of his people, is not worthy of their leadership. And what we're saying is that we want seven leaders that will listen to the people, no matter how foolish they are. It was four lepers at the gates of Samaria that went back to tell the king that the economy was changing in Nigeria. You say that they are lepers. What do they know? They are area boys. Get out, get out. You can't come near the state house. Can you imagine? You would have lost a whole revolution because people were just not listening. 
My appeal is to our leaders, be humble, be normal, be human beings. You were first of all a human being before you became a leader. You cannot lose your humanity because people are fucking around you. One is carrying your bag, one is carrying your pen, one is carrying your umbrella, and you now feel that you are greater than anybody else. You are not. You are just a man like anybody else, and you must not forget that. Only God is king, and only king, only God is to be feared. And what I'm saying to the people, stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. What are you afraid of? We need to speak to our leaders. They need to help the people. The people must be set free. They must be allowed to develop themselves. You cannot have one billion as your budget, and you've taken 80% of it to build house, to buy this, to buy that, and the people are impoverished. It's not fair. That's all we're saying. And the people must have a voice, and they must say so. If you don't say it, they won't know it, and they'll keep thinking what they're doing is right. And so the church must rise up and stop playing the ostrich. Just, they have the platform. I, I and like so also move there. the mosques and the alphas. They must. You know, I'm reaching out to a lot of my friends who are Muslims and a lot of my alpha friends and a lot of my allergy friends and say we must work on this thing together. Nigeria belongs to all of us. We are all stakeholders in this country. Nobody must say he's more of a stakeholder than myself. No, it's just privilege and grace that makes you governor and makes me ordinary Itwa. It's just grace. It's just the grace of God. And you mustn't abuse that grace. It's a privilege for God to use you to change the lives of people. And you must try and do it. And what some of these leaders don't understand is if they did the right thing, people will clap for them. And what they're looking for, running up and down, spending billions of naira for, they will get it on the platter of gold. Nigerians are easy to govern. They just want a space in the sun. And if you make space for them, you can go and do what you want. Okay. They won't bother you. Okay. I want to come in know. there because I, you, uh, you made a very interesting it. point about us speaking up, us, you know, not being afraid. The last time that we came together to speak up about anything. I'd like to take you back to October 20 of 2020. We all were witnesses to what happened at the Lekki Toll. And that issue is gradually gathering dust. Uh, it seemed to have been swept under the carpet just like that. So telling the average Nigerian to not be afraid, speak up, um, uh, say whatever you need to say, you must be heard, no matter what it, it takes, you have to speak about the government. But like you said, you know what criticism has taken a lot of people to, and, and those who decided to say enough is enough, today we are unable, as Nigerians, to protest. It's not written anywhere, but every single time a group of people decide that they're going to protest, they release this, the police, they release the army. So really, where does the office of the citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria come in here? It cannot continue forever. France went through the same thing. And then one day the people stormed the Bastille and the Bastille came crashing down. You know, there's no only so far that you can push a people, okay? And what they did at that toll gate was very unfair. And they know it. You know, you don't turn your guns on your own citizens, okay? Yes, you can come there, tell them to please leave. You know, there have been protests all over the world. People have been marshaled out of that place carefully and told them that enough of your process. No, what they did out there is totally unfair, and they know it. In their beds, in their consciences, they know it. And we just must have a way to comfort the nation and to suit the, 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 the affairs of the nation. Whether somebody gave the order of the soldier or whoever was being a bit too enthusiastic and blah, 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 somebody must take responsibility. Because somebody put the guns in the hands of those soldiers and put the bullets in the hands of those soldiers, whether live or dummy bullets, all I know is that people died at that place. And if, and no, and if nobody takes to, responsibility to for what yeah, happened, yeah. because it looks like nobody Sorry? is, in a case where nobody takes responsibility as it is right now, what then happens? What is the face of the average Nigerian? Because again, fear reverberates across the minds of the people even when they know that they're being oppressed. Now, you did make mention of something in your last interview. Um, you talked about us naming uh, these politicians, saying their names, but you did not say too many names. You said one name. Again, how, how do we say names of politicians or, you know, start pointing fingers if, you know, 
But we know that they might come after us. They can't come after you. Why should they come after you? Coming after you with what? A politician is a citizen as myself, okay? Or he may have some instruments of government here and there, but it's only temporary. The law of Nigeria says you can run office for only four times two years and so on. So after eight years, you come back home. You understand? And what I said is that we must go to each one of them and address them and speak to them and talk to them and, who are and these tell people? them, Why can't, Mr. Who, so who are these people? Eh? Who are these one, each and every? Because everybody keeps asking why you, are, you were not able to mention the names of these people. Why could you not name them when you were saying we should name them? Who are these people? Can you name them? Well, these people that we need to go to and ask them to let the people go. I said they are gatekeepers in Nigeria, okay? And the gatekeepers are the people in power, okay? And we know the people in power. You know the governor of Lagos State, governor of Kwara, governor of Edo, governor of uh, Shokoto, governor of Zamfara. You know them. They are there. We must go to each one of them and speak to them. You know the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You know the chief of staff of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You know the vice president thereof. You know the head of service. You know the secretary to the government. We have to go to each one of them. You know the ministers thereof. I say they are gatekeepers of Nigeria. You know the leaders of each of the political parties that are in power or out of power today. You know the president of the Senate. You know the uh, speaker of the House of Representatives. They are the gatekeepers of Nigeria. They are the ones that have constituted themselves into a political club. We must go and talk to each one of them. Each one of them. This man, what you are doing is good, no problem. But this one, what you are doing is not good. You must change or you must leave. It's as simple as that. They're not strange people to us. Uh, there is no, there is no hidden name that you do not know, hidden person. But, and that's but these what people I'm are unaccessible to people us. You know, you know this, Pastor. They're not the accessible to us. Of Nigeria. These people are Sorry. inaccessible to us. Yeah. They, they, you. I mean, in fact, let's start with the people who represent us in our, either our constituencies or senatorial districts. You cannot even have access to sometimes your local government chairman. Most people don't even know who their local government chairman are. And some of them don't even live in those local governments. So, I mean, that's where the issue even starts. And these gatekeepers you're referring to are inaccessible to us. So where do we even start when you say, let's go to them and tell them this? We cannot have access to these guys. It sounds pretty that aloof to me. That, that is the beginning. But they have offices, they have homes. We will go there. They are, are they going to lock themselves up in their offices? We will go there. We're not ready. That's the problem. Why should your governor be inaccessible to you? That's the beginning. Is he going to stay in his state house forever? Is he not going to drive on the streets of Lagos? When you see his convoy, you don't recognize it? Why should your governor be inaccessible to you? Why should your local government chairman be inaccessible to you? And those who are not inaccessible, they have offices. If you go to your local government chairman's office today, you will see him. He's not going to tell you he's not going to, he's not going to, he's not going to, he's not going to see you. It's not possible. He doesn't, he doesn't have as much security as the governor. He's there. The problem is that you won't go there. How can you not know your local government chairman? And if you go there, you know his name, he doesn't see you. Hey, election is coming now. Are you going to vote for him again? He's not God. <laughs> the governor was living amongst us yesterday now. Well, he's now he's moved into state house. So his, his office is in Marina. You go there. I want to see my governor. Do you have an appointment? I don't have an appointment. Call his secretary. Call his uh, chief of staff. Let me make an appointment to see him. And, and then we get go, arrested you go for to being the press. a nuisance. I'll come and tell you that yesterday I went to see governor so-and-so. He refused to see me. Put it in your news and tell the whole world that he refused to see me. Will you put it in your news? Tell them. Well, before, Put it in be, your news. before he gets to the news, would probably be the person would probably be arrested for being a nuisance. What do you mean being a nuisance? If of you course. go to England today and stand in front of Ten Downing Street, be you a tramp or anything, Pastor, and say you want England to see the is too far you away. It, it, you're comparing us with a, a saner climb. This is Nigeria, sir. We have to create that sanity in Nigeria, my dear. That's the problem. You know, a lot of people don't want to do anything. They just want to stay there and say, these people are not gods, they're human beings. Ah, 
They are human beings. That's their starting point. They are not. They are human beings. They are flesh and blood. As a matter of fact, you'll be surprised that a lot of them are lonely and looking for people who come and talk to them. They are not gods. What do you mean they are inaccessible? They have drivers. They have cooks. They have all sorts of people who live in their houses, who work for them. Why can you not see your uh, president? Why, why, why? You should be able to see your president. A, a president should have town hall meetings on a regular basis, dealing oh. with all sorts of people. That's a whole kettle of fish. You, you don't want us to go down that road, Pastor Isua, but uh, I want to thank you so much for being part of... This country <laughs> must change. And this is how we're going to change it. Okay. This country must change. And you people in the press must make sure the country changes. I need to must speak out and tell them what we need to do to govern this country properly. Tell them. I believe you that's don't just keep saying excellency, excellency all over the place. For how long? Well, I believe, I believe that that's what we're doing. I want to say thank you so much to you, Pastor Ito. The country Ito must change, yo. Can you hear what I'm saying? I this country hear. must change. And you hear. press, you have a lot of role to play in this thing. You have a lot of role to play. You okay. have to keep talking about it. Okay. You have to keep letting people know that the state of nation, the, the first thing said that you said that, me, I can't see my governor. I can't see my president. That's zero to start off with. Mm. Impossible. Okay. If he's my president, I should be able to see him. All right. He, he should be able to see me. He should be able to hear from me. If you write a letter to Joe Biden today, in a month he will reply you. Fashola used to do that when he was in Lagos. He would used to reply the letters of little children. Well, he must I, do it. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Pastor Itwai Godalo. He is the senior pastor of the Trinity House Church here in Lagos, Nigeria. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, Governor Yahya Bello receives a political advice. What is it? We'll tell you when we come back. Stay with us.